In a horror movie, there is always a monster. A wife and mother is brutally slaughtered. Horribly and tragically. She was alive as he beat her brains out. But who's behind this savage attack? Imagine the horror, seeing someone coming at her in a suit, with a mask and gloves and a crowbar. It's a murder mystery like no other. They're still amateur killers, and we're professional catchers of killers. With an ending no one saw coming. That got us thinking that maybe this was some of this was staged. Somebody else was out there who was going to come get her. It's the day before Christmas break for most people in the affluent area of Upper Marion Township, Pennsylvania, when Raphael Robb, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, returns from morning errands to discover his wife, Ellen, in a pool of blood. He calls police. There's no audio of the call, but in a transcript released by the Upper Marion Police Department, Raphael states, Hello, yeah, I just came home and found my wife murdered on the kitchen floor. The officer responding, she's killed? Yes. How can you tell? I know, her head is cracked. Is there anyone in the house? There is a broken window in the back. Okay, stay out front. There are police and an ambulance coming. In minutes, police arrive and cordon off the area. Inside, it appears that housewife and mother Ellen Robb was wrapping up last-minute holiday gifts in the kitchen. She had been seated at a kitchen table, oddly facing the wall. Ellen never sees it coming. A shotgun blast to the face. Experienced detectives would initially see a wound or a series of wounds like that and think shotgun blast. Next, CSI moves in and documents the bloodbath, every grisly angle captured. The photos that we saw in this case pale in comparison to anything we've ever seen. We have seen horrendous accidents, people being hit by train, people being eaten alive by animals, and these photos were the worst we've ever seen. There was a lot of blood around where her body was found, mostly at the head area. Police speak with Ellen's husband, Raphael. They ask him where he was during the morning hours his wife was viciously murdered. Raphael explains he took his 12-year-old daughter, Olivia, to school, stopped at a local grocery store, then dropped off his grades at the University of Pennsylvania before returning home to find his wife. He was away during the time when Ellen probably was killed. Investigators pull surveillance footage of his various stops. Raphael's alibi appears to check out. Detectives continue to search the home looking for clues. That's when they spot shards of glass by a back door. Somebody had broken glass, and it was one of those doors where with a broken pane of glass, a burglar could reach in and unlock a door. Right away, investigators theorize... It must have been a burglary that occurred there. And the motive for murder? The victim's going to identify the, uh, the perpetrator. It seems like an open and shut case. Then, as police continue to collect evidence and piece together what happened, Ellen's brother Gary arrives. He's there to pick up his sister for the holidays. As I drove up to the house, I saw the house quarantined with the police tape, jumped out of my car, and quickly learned that she had been killed. It's devastating news for Gary. Ellen is more than a sister. She's like a second mother to him. When she was in college, she worked three jobs and sent her earnings home to my mother so that she could support my brother and myself while she raised us as a single parent. And now, sadly, she's gone. I saw them put her lifeless body in the ambulance. The timing couldn't be more tragic. She was, uh, she was going to come up to Boston to celebrate her 50th birthday, to celebrate Christmas with her daughter and, and our family. Then, in front of a swarm of black and whites, a yellow school bus pulls up. It's Raphael and Ellen's 12-year-old daughter, Olivia. She comes home to see her house surrounded with police tape, flashing lights everywhere, policemen, ambulance. She gets out, walks up to her house, and a 12-year-old girl says, I live here. Gary sends his niece to a neighbor's house while he tries to comprehend the tragedy unfolding in front of his eyes. Immediately, thoughts run through your mind as to how could this possibly happen. You're in a most peaceful, beautiful suburban neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. Murders 
and killings of this nature just don't occur in that section of suburban Philadelphia. Authorities continue to investigate the case as a burglary gone horribly wrong. And now they can't help but wonder if there's a murderer on the loose looking to rob housewives alone in their homes. The only problem is that Ellen wasn't alone. There was a little dog there, and animals invariably walk in the blood and trample blood prints all over the place. But the dog was locked in a bedroom. Who does that? No burglar would do that. And there's something else that's troublesome for detectives. The broken window pane on the door where the burglar allegedly gained entry. None of the glass is crushed beneath where the killer would have walked. And it's not just contradictory evidence on the floor. It's on the ceiling, too. The way the blood cast off had been found on various patterns, especially on the ceiling. Detectives believe the blood spatter patterns don't match up with a shotgun blast to the face. The blood splatter that was uh, particularly critical. And it's not long before their suspicions are confirmed when Ellen's x-rays come back from the morgue. And the results? X-rays had shown that it was not a gunshot wound. It had been a blunt force trauma injury. It immediately changes the focus of the type of person that you're looking for. Coming up. We're talking about a bad guy with a black heart. 